All right, let's get the evening going. Welcome, everybody. Safe and Just Michigan's annual dinner. Thank you. We appreciate all of you for showing up. Let's get started. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the NBA draft, but we got these new cool hats, and I feel like I just got drafted. <laughs> And for anybody that's wondering, no, you can't have one. <laughs> These are exclusive for staff and board members only. We like you partners, we appreciate you, but this one's ours. <laughs> that in mind, we've had quite a few victories. We've had quite a few losses this year. 2023 has been a rough one, to say the least. For those of you that have stood by us as we weathered the storm and made it to October, thank you. We finally, we finally reached the fourth quarter of this year. As we get ready to wrap up and head into next year, 2024, with lots of hopes, prayers, Please, maybes, and thank yous. There's a lot of work to be done. Even though we accomplished so much, in the bigger scheme of things, we didn't do enough. Michigan still has over 30,000 people incarcerated. We still have people with criminal convictions that can't get employment, who can't get housing, who can't get a fair shake at being a citizen of the state of Michigan. With that in mind, that's, that is exactly why we do the work. Everybody in this room stands for something when it comes to justice. Today is a representation of us standing together in the name of justice. All the work that has been done has been done through and by people in this room. We respect each and every one of you here at Safe and Just Michigan. We partner with quite a few of you, quite a few dignitaries in the room that respect the work. We come from the ground up with our work. We give voices to the people that typically don't get heard. Myself personally, I am the director of outreach and community partnerships. Part of my job is to bridge that communication gap with people on the ground and people up top. And when I say people up top, I mean the top of organizations, our legislators, our governor, organizations that typically would not be brought into the criminal justice space. One thing I've learned in this role is everybody wants to talk about reform, but not everybody wants their name attached to reform. That's all right, though. That's all right. Because what we need them for, I don't need them to add a name to it. We don't need them to say that they did it. We just need them to help us get it changed. We need Michigan to be one of the most inclusive states in the country when it comes to people leaving prison, when it comes to preventing people from going to prison. Our system is flawed. We know it. Society doesn't understand it. Our communities are suffering. We're in a weird space when it comes to reform in this country. Furthermore, in Michigan, we've got a desire for change from the people that are being impacted by it the most. But we don't have people at the top that are willing to listen. One of the most beneficial trips that I took was earlier this year. 
I was on a trip with some of the most impressive business leaders in the state of Michigan just recently. And at the conclusion of that trip, there was a question that was asked. How can we do more? That's a big question coming from the head of DTE. That's a big question coming from the head of an airport. That's a huge question coming from people that are connected to the amount of money that none of us could ever imagine seeing. That was an opportunity for me to see how the other side lives. I thought the same thing. It was funny at first. But what you see on TV, I can tell you is real. When you get off of a private jet and there's SUVs with the guy standing outside of it with the door open, that's a reality for some people. Most of us only imagine it. We see it on TV and we're like, oh, that's cool. But to actually see it up close and in person and to hear them want to know more about our issues because they didn't know that this was happening, because they're so far removed from reality that they don't know the stuff happens or exists in their own communities, the people that they represent, that was an opportunity to speak truth to power. My response to those people was join the board of one of these organizations. Show up, listen, and I don't want your secretary. I don't want your chief of staff. I don't want the intern that you took on this year. If you're gonna be intentional about it, let's be intentional about it. Show up as you. I don't want a representative. Tough conversation, but look around. Any executives at your table? They didn't take the challenge. But I promise you, I'm going to continue to push it in their faces. I'm going to continue to speak to that power. Because this is not a safe place. It's not safe when you can't understand how other people live. When you're being judged based off of what somebody else wrote on a piece of paper. When you're being criticized based on a record that may not be yours. Clean Slate has been a huge, huge campaign for us at Safe and Just Michigan. The state of Michigan has done a damn good job at helping out with getting people's records expunged. But one thing a lot of people don't realize or understand, we hear about those difficult cases. We hear about the big cases, the murder cases, the armed robberies. What about that person that pled guilty to a paper crime so that they can get home on Monday, so they didn't lose their house? But that conviction carries over into employment. Or that conviction prevents them from getting quality housing, all because they were trying to save themselves. They were trying to spare their house or their family or make sure their kids got to school on time or they didn't miss too many days from work. So they took the easy route instead of fighting to prove themselves. Unfortunately, that's a reality of how our system works. Those are the ones that we don't hear about. Thankfully, Clean Slate has done a magnificent job of freeing those people from the shackles of our justice system. Big campaign, lots of work. We still have a lot more to do. There's a lot of legislative reform coming down the pipeline. We appreciate our partners. Let's work. Tonight, I bring to the stage Anna Cohn, John Cooper.
tough act to follow, always a tough act to follow. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for being here. On behalf of the Board of Directors, uh, my name is Anna Cohn. I'm the President of the Board of Directors. And uh, on behalf of our team, we want to welcome you to this celebration of healing. Um, we have a wonderful evening in store. And it's made even more wonderful by all of your presence in this room. Um, at our annual meeting last week, we elected five new members to our board. And we're very, very excited about that. Hold your applause till the end. They include Tracy Weaver Brame, Jose Burgos, Judith Gracie, Anthony Legion, and Dr. Jeffrey Morinoff. I also want to congratulate our incumbent board members who were reelected, including Eileen Hayes and Joe Haveman. And I think you'll agree that these newly minted directors are a true testament to what we've become, to who we've become as an organization since we, since all the way back in the day when we were still CAPS. Um, in my conversations with each of these new board members, uh, it was evident that Safe and Just is continuing to build a reputation of integrity and positively affecting policies demonstrated by the caliber of individuals who are joining this team. We've worked to ensure a future where everyone is safe in their own communities, and together we can secure the resources and reforms needed to ensure the people most harmed and least served by the criminal justice system are able to heal and thrive. 2023 has been a perfect example of what can be accomplished when powerful advocates, courageous lawmakers, and those directly impacted by our troublesome criminal justice system come together with a unified voice. I would be remiss not to mention two leaders who are greatly missed in this space since last year. In late 2022, we tragically lost two of our fiercest advocates, Danny Jones. Danny's presence exuded in his words, peace and love. He is still mourned deeply today and every day. And Earl Burton. Earl's resilience throughout his life, coupled with his infectious smile, brought us all so much joy. Please join me for a moment of silence as we hold those memories of our loved ones close to us. Thank you. I know that both Danny and Earl would be right alongside all of us at the rallies and community events we've had over the course of the year. And I know they'd want us to keep the milestones and celebrations going. And we will. So I want to close on a note of gratitude for the tireless efforts of the staff who keep Safe and Just running every day, including our CEO, John Cooper, our COO, Kate McCracken, our uh, very own Ken Nixon, who joined us in 2023 as Director of Outreach and Community Partnerships. And I also want to call out our wonderful, hardworking staff who made this a banner year, including Veronica French, Ashley Bellant, Barbara Wheeland, Cassie LaRue, Dina Anderson, our newest hire, Jasmine Wells, Kamau Sandiford, Ronnie Waters, and Zach Whaley. We look forward to celebrating more successes with you all, and we are excited to share what's on the horizon in 2024. And for that, I will turn it over to John. Thanks so much, Anna. Uh, I have a brief, um, a, a brief overview of some of our accomplishments this past year, and then I'm going to talk just a little bit about the political climate that we're working in. Um, so first, accomplishments. Uh, number one, on the list is implementation of the automatic expungement in April. Um, that was the culmination of nearly five years of work for us. And I'm happy to report that uh, last time I checked, 4.5 million criminal conviction records have been sealed as a result of this law. Um, um, And there's, there's a couple things about the law that I'm especially proud of. Uh, the first is that 
we were the first state in the country to seal felonies automatically. Not, not all of the felonies that should be sealed, but we were the first to do any. And second, we were the first state to allow automatic expungements to people who have outstanding criminal justice debt. So the first states that did this, Pennsylvania and Utah, had disqualifiers and said you only get your records sealed if you don't owe any money. And the reality is most people who have records do. So we were able to pass without that restriction. That was a big deal. Um, along the same lines, we've been advocating the last couple years for reductions in phone fees. And there are partners in the room who worked with us on this. But um, the big, big one was last year. Uh, there was a 12 cents a minute uh, surcharge that was funneled into a slush fund at MDOC called the Special Equipment Fund. We and others successfully advocated for the elimination of the surcharge and this fund. Um, this year we came back and got another 15% reduction in phone fees. Um, between the two, we're looking at five to six million dollars annually saved for incarcerated people and their loved ones. Um, final thing I want to know just about this year is, um, so for the last 25 years, Michigan's sentencing system has operated with little oversight. As uh, many of you know, in 1998, the legislature passed the current sentencing guidelines along with the 100% truth in sentencing law. And then they defunded the commission that created the guidelines. I, I think that tells you all you need to know about those guidelines. Um, but in any event, a bill to create a sentencing commission that will bring much needed oversight and scrutiny to the sentencing guidelines is close to passing. And a million dollars has already been included in the budget to fund staff including data analysts, criminologists, and the like. So we're, we're looking forward to helping uh, set that up, assuming it does pass. And um, if you've got anyone who might be interested in contributing to that effort, let us know. Finally, political context. I, Ken alluded to some of this. He may have put it differently than I would. But the reality is, um, Leadership in the legislature is not ready to work on some of the big criminal justice issues that we are advocating for. And that is largely a function of the election dynamics next year around the state house. Um, those dynamics are not likely to change between now and the election. So it's gonna be tough sledding for several of our major priorities. We are not gonna slow down or stop. We're gonna keep pushing. And I do think we have a chance to move some of that stuff especially because we have really excellent committee chairs in both chambers that are supportive of what we're trying to do. Um, but we also have some other priorities we want to work on, I just want to mention. Um, first thing we're working on, and Ken is helping lead this effort, is um, m many of you may be aware that if you have a felony record, it's very hard to get a job in a hospital, and that there's actually a 10-year ban on anyone with a felony getting a job in a hospital. There's one to five year bans for misdemeanors. But like our hospitals don't have enough workers and all the hospitals are complaining about this. Yet we're, you know, just if you look at the numbers, there's 35 to 40,000 felony convictions that come out of our courts every year. Those 35 to 40,000 people over the course of 10 years mean we're saying hundreds of thousands of people in the state of Michigan can't work at a hospital because they, solely because they have a criminal conviction. That doesn't make a lot of sense and we are working with lawmakers major hospital chains, and impacted people to change that law. So you're going to be hearing more about that in the months to come. Um, an <laughs> We're also working on a, a portal, an access portal, for people who are affected by the automatic expungement to check their records for free. Right now, the only resource that's out there is a, a fee-for-service database maintained by the state police that is missing critical court data so people, if you're checking iChat, that is not your complete record. Don't rely on it. Um, we've been in touch with the governor's office and others involved in implementation of Clean Slate. They have not been as responsive to this as we would like. We hope there's going to be money in next year's budget to, to stand this up. But we could use all of your help in making sure that happens because people who are impacted by the Clean Slate law do not currently have access to the information they need to stop checking the box. And we need to help correct that. Um, and with that, I will turn to the award portion of this evening. Um, so the first award we're going to give out today is the Millikan Award. And this is one we've been giving out for a, a long time. Uh, Barb Levine created it, the CAPS founder. Um, it's named after the former governor, William G. Millikan, 
He's Michigan's longest serving governor. He came to support criminal justice reform efforts in the 70s, 80s, and 90s after initially favoring a harsh approach to crime and punishment. Um, this year, we're proud to honor State Senator Stephanie Chang. Um, and <laughs> I, I have a very brief introduction. <laughs> so, um, so uh, currently, she is the, the chair of the Senate Committee on Civil Rights, Judiciary, and Public Safety, which handles essentially all of the issues we work on. She is a terrific and supportive committee chair who we love deeply. Um, if you don't know her, she is the first Asian American woman elected to the Michigan legislature. She served a couple terms in the House before becoming Democratic floor leader uh, during her first term in the Senate. Um, she's also the uh, Senate Democratic Policy and Steering Chair, in addition to being committee chair. Uh, she's been a longtime advocate for reforms to the system, and I'm not going to list all of the things she's worked on. Um, but Raise the Age, the Jail Task Force Package, Clean Slate, um, a variety of other topics. Um, and she is also the lead sponsor of the Second Look Bills, which I'm sure many of you have heard of. Um, so please join me in thanking Senator Chang for her advocacy and her courage. We, are, we have a box with a clock in it, too. Um, <laughs> Well, thank you so much and good evening. Uh, really just honored to be here. Thank you so much for this incredible award, uh, but mostly thank you to Safe and Just Michigan for all the great work that you're doing. Uh, it's really impressive to just hear all the great things that you're doing as well as just how much your team has expanded over the years. It's amazing. Uh, but just really want to express my gratitude again uh, to Safe and Just as well as all of you for being here, uh, for supporting Safe and Just Michigan and the work that all of you are doing. I know it's really, really hard. Um, as John sort of mentioned, I think that we are in this moment of both opportunity and challenge. Uh, I think we all know about all of the challenges as well as the opportunities, but just really want to underscore that, uh, you know, there was a lot that led up to this moment. There was a lot uh, that led up to a change in terms of who was in power in Lansing, and there is still much more that we can do uh, to dislodge many of the issues that you all care about. Um, and I know it can be really challenging, uh, but I know that this room is full of folks who are extremely hardworking, extremely committed, extremely passionate, driven by our values, and, and who do not give up. So um, just really so grateful because you all are amazing and it's an honor to be here. Uh, so please don't give up. I think that's my main thing that I wanna make sure that you all know is that I know that it can be tough going on a lot of the issues that we care about in the criminal justice reform space. But as Dr. King said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. So every day, every bit of advocacy that you do, whether it's social media or a meeting with a lawmaker or organizing an event uh, or an op-ed or a letter, every, every one of those actions really matters. So we are bending that arc more and more. So just keep going. Uh, wanted to just highlight a couple of the issues. Sentencing Commission, yes, we're almost there. So we're uh, working really hard. Um, really, really thrilled about this bill that my former colleague, uh, David Legrand, uh, has been working so hard on. Um, and this is something that honestly just makes sense, right? We've got sentencing guidelines, so we need a sentencing commission. So uh, really working hard to just get us over the finish line there in the Senate. Um, and we're gonna make it happen. Um, on second look, I know we've got a lot of folks here who have been working so, so hard on second look. Uh, I'm so proud to be a sponsor on this package along with uh, Representative Wilson in the House and just so many others. Um, this is gonna be a tough, tough challenge, right? But it's something that we know is the right thing to do. It is all, when we talk about forgiveness and we talk about second chances and we talk about giving people a second look, um, these are the things that so many of us are taught as children, right? It's, it's about forgiveness and about giving people an opportunity and giving people a second chance. Um, so that's why I'm a big believer in these bills. Um, it's going to be hard. We all, we're not used, we're, we're all used to hard. We're, we're not used to easy. So we're going to work hard to make that happen. 
Um, another thing that I've been working uh, with Safe and Just Michigan on has been a, a long journey uh, related to police accountability, which sort of may or may not fall exactly in the criminal justice reform space, but is really, really key to the front end of our criminal justice system in addressing the police brutality that we are all unfortunately far too familiar with um, and which is very much not a new issue, uh, but something where I believe that we can get something done with bipartisan support uh, in order to make sure that every single person is treated with dignity uh, and respect in our justice system on the police side of things. Um, I'll also just mention uh, for many years now, I've been working with some folks on solitary confinement, which again, we've got to just keep working on this. It's something that um, I think when you talk to people and explain the conditions and explain that this is about Again, human dignity and treating people as human beings and recognize uh, the public, the health impact and the mental health impact um, that we're going to keep pushing for that. So in all of the work that you're doing, regardless of which issue it is, uh, or sometimes probably a very long list of issues that we all care about so much in, in this room, uh, just remember to keep centering our values um, and to keep uplifting those human stories, which I know you all are. Uh, but for me, you know, as a public servant, I, I literally have written uh, in my office on, our, on my whiteboard um, our, our values to just constantly remind my team of like why we are doing the work that we do. Um, so for many of you, I know that the values that we share are about forgiveness, about dignity, about fairness, and about equity. So keep those right in, the, in your center. Uh, make sure that we keep, uh, keep that there so we can keep moving forward, uh, especially when things get tough, and to always keep uh, centering those stories because we know that there's so many of you in this room and so many folks out, outside of this room whose stories need to be heard. Uh, and the more that we can share those stories, the better chance that we will have to getting these things done. So thank you so much, Safe and Jess, for all the work you do, and thank you for this honor. I forgot to say congratulations to Dev LaBelle, Pete Martell, and MCYJ. You're all my heroes, so congratulations and thank you. One more time for Stephanie Chang, please. We cannot, cannot let the moment slide by where well, we don't recognize a champion like Stephanie Chang. It's not very often you get people in a legislator, legislature with that much courage and that much bravery to go against the grain of almost everything that has been done before her. What you have been able to accomplish in such a short amount of time is commendable. Much respect to you. When this space needed a leader, you stepped in that gap. Thank you. One thing that John didn't get an opportunity to say about your award, yes, it's a clock. It's a clock. But that clock represents a time for change. You are a time for change. We needed that. I've been in many spaces with you. I've heard a lot of your accomplishments. We've been on panels. We've gotten awards together. You are a giant in this industry. Thank you. As was stated, we've had a problem with people willing to step out on a limb for reform issues. But I can tell you, SJM is not gonna stop. We're not gonna quit. And this is my promise to you. Kate, don't take this personal. But if they don't start cooperating, next year's dinner is gonna be on the governor's front lawn. 
<laughs> Remember I said that, so get you some wool socks and some coats earlier in the year when they're a little cheaper. Might be a brisk one next year. <laughs> but seriously, sometimes being radical isn't always bad. Sometimes, doing things outside of the norm aren't always bad. Going against the grain isn't always bad. But one thing that I've never, ever understood was how is it that in this day and age, we're celebrating people for doing the right thing? Is so much of society going the other direction that we have to recognize the moments when someone actually does the right thing? That's the space that we're in today. We have to acknowledge the few that are strong enough to do the right thing. That's sad. That's sad. But. If my role is to keep congratulating those that are doing the right thing, let's do it. <laughs> let's get it done, because I want more people in that space. I want more people to feel how it feels to be welcomed and celebrated. So if you want your opportunity at an award next year, do something great. <laughs> <laughs> we don't pass out many of them. But if you want your name in the hat, be better than you were this year. <laughs> Why y'all laughing? <laughs> I meant that. Go be great every day, not just sometimes, every day. Every single day. John brought up some of the campaigns that we're working on. Some of the things that we don't talk about, we always typically see the end result, right? We see the passenger or the failure of these laws or changes that we're trying to get made. But something that I've noticed as I embarked on this conviction-based barriers to healthcare, it's really ironic how the people that are in the industry also want the change. They're seeking us out because they're having problems with the laws. But they don't have the knowledge or the power to get those laws changed. So when we start that conversation with, hey, we're trying to fix this, next thing you know, we're getting emails from people like, hey, we want to help you fix this. This is a problem for us, too. Great. Let's work together. Let's get this to the finish line together. Let's get more people working. Everybody in this room understands where the quality of health care is right now. Everybody in this room has been to urgent care or emergency room or a doctor's visit and had to wait an exorbitant amount of time for a cough or a stomach ache. That's not where we want to be in society, where you can't find quality help. People are being excluded from this industry for things that have nothing to do with their ability to perform the job. If I'm dying, and I call the EMS, and that person shows up with a defibrillator, the very last question on my mind is, have you been to prison before? <laughs> I don't care where you've been, save me. <laughs> but for whatever reason, the higher ups in the healthcare industry thinks that this should be an ex exclusion. Saving lives should have barriers to it. Keeping people healthy should have restrictions associated. I think I speak for all of SJM when I say, not on our watch. <laughs> that being said, I want to talk to you guys about our guest speaker tonight. You are in for a treat. And when I say a treat, this guy is definitely one of the best at what he does. So much of our industry 
only hears from one side. We hear from people that are on the conviction side. What we've been able to identify is we're not the only victims. There's people on the other side of justice that feel the same way about our issues as we do. And bringing those voices to the table are extremely important. There is, these voices have been undervalued for years. Why? Who knows? But what you're about to hear and who you're about to hear from is a true champion of justice. This man knows statistics. He knows the facts. He knows the numbers. You're going to get an education lesson tonight in a good way. Aswad Thomas is not only a victim of crime, but he's also a champion of justice. Thank you for supplying your voice to such an important movement. You do an excellent job at what you do. Please welcome Oswald Thomas to the stage. Good evening, everyone. First, I want to uh, just say, um, you know, thank you to the uh, Safe and Just Michigan team. It's been, a, it's been an honor, it's been a privilege to, to work in, in close partnership with you all the past few years. And thank you to everyone that played a key role in, in having me be the featured speaker um, at tonight's event, which is the celebration of, of healing. Uh, Senator, I also want to thank you on behalf of the Alliance for Safety and Justice for your vision, your leadership. Um, on public safety, take individuals like you to help change uh, this country. You know, as I'm standing here today, you know, I must say it's really been a long journey to get to this point of my life and my career. You know, I think about uh, healing, you know, that's been at the center of my life, uh, of healing through action. Um, so I grew up in Highland Park, uh, which is, you know, about a 45 minutes hour uh, from here. Um, I grew up in, uh, in, in Highland Park in a community riddled by poverty and violence. And I grew up in a single parent household uh, as the youngest son of five boys. And I watched my older brothers and their friends, you know, walk the path of destruction because there wasn't a lot of opportunities for young black men in my neighborhood also across the city of Detroit and across the state of Michigan. So for me as the youngest uh, son, you know, I, I spent most of my time playing basketball and focusing on my education, but also I spent most of my time hanging out with my childhood best friend, uh, Reuben Elder. You know, Reuben and I, we were the, the youngest uh, boys in our families. Uh, we were both straight A students. We walked to school uh, together every day. We stopped at the corner store to get a box of nerds. For some reason, we thought that would make us smarter uh, in the classroom, right? <laughs> and we also spent a lot of time just being kids in the neighborhood, just dreaming of what our life could be if we made it out of that neighborhood. Unfortunately, Ruben um, was, was shot and killed uh, in the drive-by shooting in 1993 when he was only 10 years old. Uh, Ruben was the first friend that I lost to violence. And I remember as kids, you know, after Ruben's death, you know, we had to go back to school a few days later. Uh, there wasn't no assembly at our school. There wasn't no counselors or therapists. You know, there wasn't any place in the neighborhood for us as kids and in our families to deal with losing the life of someone, uh, you know, someone so young to uh, violence. So our community just kind of went on, you know, but that I carried Reuben with me uh, every single day. And it was a promise that Reuben and I made to each other that we were making out of the neighborhood. We didn't know how we was going to do it, but we was going to do all that we can. So I, I kept that promise and I focused my life on the basketball court. You know, for me, uh, you know, in, in many uh, kids, you know, basketball wasn't just a sport for me. It was the only safe place that I had in my neighborhood 
They allowed me to get away from the negative influences that surrounded me. And basketball was the key of success in my life, but also was my academics um, as well. So I ended up becoming the first male in my family to ever graduate uh, from college. Um, also was a, a star uh, basketball player in 2009. So for me, 2009, that was the highest point of my life. Right, I just graduated from college. I also was on the brink of going overseas to play professional basketball, but unfortunately, I became a victim of gun violence. You know, I was shot uh, twice in my back uh, during an uh, armed robbery while leaving a corner store in my neighborhood. And I remember being in that hospital, and I remember the doctor coming over to me and telling me that, that I was shot. And I remember him saying that we're not sure if you will be able to walk again. But what I thought immediately was, will I ever play basketball again? So those nights in the hospital of, of not being able to uh, feel any movement in my legs, um, suffering from two gunshot wounds and suffering from just uh, tremendous pain. So I was released from the hospital uh, back into the same community where I was shot. Right, so I remember the doctors and my nurses telling me about the physical challenges that I would have recovering from these two gunshot wounds. But nobody never prepared me for the psychological effects of being a victim of gun violence, but also having to return back to the same community where I was shot with no support. So I was dealing with the, the flashbacks and the nightmares and, and waking up in the middle of the night, dealing with the PTSD, the fear, the isolation, the depression, the deep hurts of losing my basketball career. And during my recovery, I had many interactions with law enforcement. So law enforcement came to visit me several times as I was recovering on the couch of my mother's one bedroom apartment. And each time they came to visit me, it was always about the case. They never asked me how I was doing. They never told me about any victim services. They never told me about the victim compensation program that's meant to help crime victims get access to support. In fact, they never told me about a victim advocate from their department who's supposed to work with victims like myself. So my family and I never received any help after I became a victim of gun violence. So as I'm recovering from these, these gunshot wounds and going through these traumatic experiences and, and, and this deep depression, and also dealing with the fact that, I, that I'm not able to play professional basketball uh, anymore, I started to think about, like, am I the only person that went through this? And I, I thought about my family. So I called my father. My father was uh, shot in his chest in the 1980s. And I say, hey, Dad, when you were shot, did you get any help? And my dad is Jamaican, he just, boy, shut up, he just hung up on me. <laughs> right? I say, that was weird. So then I called my second oldest brother. My second oldest brother was shot uh, here in Detroit in his back in the 1990s. And I asked him that same question, hey, bro, when you got shot, did you get any help? And he said, no. So then I called my two first cousins and asked them that same question, did you get help? And they said, no. So in my immediate family, from my father, my brother, and my two cousins, and myself, five out of 10 males are victims of gun violence. And we all had plenty of interactions with the justice system, but none that led to any help at all. And so as I was recovering and processing what I was going through, what my family was going through, I started to think about, is this, is this a common theme in my community? So I started to talk to the mothers of, 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 of my friends who I've lost to violence over the years. And I remember making those calls and say, hey, Ms. Johnson, you know, when, when, when Anthony passed away, you know, how has it been going for you? What type of help did you receive? And it was that same answer, no help. Then I started talking to victims of domestic violence and sexual assault in my neighborhood, asking them that same question, asking black women um, who have been victims of violence, did you get any help? And it was no. So here I am doing my own personal research of talking to my family and talking to my uh, community, and the majority of them never got access to any support or services as well. 
So I started to see this, this key theme that was happening in my neighborhood for decades, that communities most impacted by violence are least supported by the justice system and least supported by victim services. But the thing that changed my life and led me on this path of this work that I do today was during my last doctor's appointment. So as I'm having surgery to remove the bullets out of my back, you know, my doctor was performing uh, the surgery on me. I remember him saying, you know, hey, Aswai, you remind me of someone, uh, you know, from your neighborhood. Um, he described this young man. This young man was also a victim of gun violence. Um, he was shot at the age of 14 years old, and he was shot in his left eye. And as a result of that shooting, he lost sight in his left eye. And as he's sharing more details about this young man, my heart just started beating faster on the operating table. It was because I was realizing that he was describing one of the young men that shot me. And I say, Dr. Marshall, can you pause because I have to tell you something. And I told him that you had just described the young person that shot me. And I remember my doctor uh, saying, this is how the cycle of violence continues in communities. Because he had treated that same young man at the age of 14 years old, was released from the hospital back into that same community with no support, and look what happened years later. So I strongly believe like that young man at the age of 14 years old, I couldn't imagine what he was going through with no support, no mental health services, no housing relocation to get away from that neighborhood. And I strongly believe his unaddressed trauma played a huge role with my shooting as well. And that's when I started to think about, I couldn't play basketball anymore. What's, what's the next chapter in my life? So I en enrolled back in school to get my master's uh, in social work. So I actually wanted to study the impact of trauma that it have on individuals, families, um, and communities. But I also wanted to help survivors get access to the support and services. And so I joined uh, Crime Survivors for Safety uh, and Justice uh, back in 2015. And ironically, the day that I joined Crime Survivors for Safety and Justice, it was on the sixth year anniversary of my shooting. And for me, that's when everything came full circle because a day that I always associated with a negative experience suddenly became this positive experience uh, for me. And one of, the, one of the first things I did uh, with Crime Survivors for Safety and Justice, I started coming back home uh, here to Detroit. And one of the first survivors that I met is in the room uh, with us today, Ms. Sherry Ware. Um, and, and, and talking to Ms. Sherry, who's a survivor of domestic violence and other survivors um, in the community, and, and, and we all shared that common experience, right, Sherry? That, that most of us have been victims here in the state of Michigan, also across the country, but we wasn't receiving any support or services. So we wanted to do something about that, right, Sherry? So what we started to do, we started to grow across the state of Michigan just listening to crime victims, listening to their stories and their experiences, but also listening to what safety looks like for them. And there's a few things that we've learned across the country, but a few things that we also learned here in Michigan. Number one is that the majority of crime victims across the state of Michigan do not access victim compensation. In fact, 98% of crime victims here in the state of Michigan do not access victim compensation. The majority of crime victims do not access any victim services at all in communities across the state. We also found out that the organizations that are doing the work in local communities that are responding to violence, helping victims uh, heal and recover, do not get the funding that's needed to meet the needs of crime victims in communities. And, and across the state of Michigan, there is an infrastructure of victim services in those communities that are most harmed by violence. So we've talked to victims and we kind of learned that the state of Michigan were failing crime victims. But we also learned what crime victims were saying about our criminal justice policies as well. We found that the majority of crime victims across the state of Michigan prefer we had a justice system that focus more on rehabilitation rather than long-term prison sentences. We heard from crime victims say we want a justice system that focus on solving the root causes of crime 
instead of sending people to prison. We also heard from crime victims that for those who have caused harm, we want them to get the support and the rehabilitation that they need while they are incarcerated so that when they come back home, they come home better than they were before. So for most crime victims in the state of Michigan and across the country, safety isn't about locking people up and throwing away the key. Safety is about helping people heal by giving them access to services and resources. Safety is about ensuring that we are prioritizing rehabilitation in our facilities, but also safety is about when people are coming out of the justice system, that we're able to get them access to housing and jobs, things that help promote economic stability. Safety is also making sure that our communities get the investments that we need to help stop the cycle of violence um, as well. So here in the state of Michigan, we've been organizing, y'all. We've been organizing, elevating this new victim's voice of survivors from those communities that are most harmed by violence. Those same communities and those survivors are bringing our voices to the state capitol as well. And our work here in Michigan is led by Ms. Priscilla Bordeo, um, who's, a, who's a resident here in Lansing, of being able to help organize survivors through our Crime Survivors for Safety and Justice program, where we have over 180,000 survivors across the country and over 8,000 survivors here in the state of Michigan. So there's three things that we do at Crime Survivors for Safety and Justice. One, we build community. Build community by bringing survivors together to share our stories, to provide peer-to-peer -peer support, but also to make sure that we are ac accessing uh, services resources to help our members heal and recover. We are also training survivors to become advocates. So for many survivors, organizing, getting involved in policy and advocacy, right, Kristen? That's part of the healing journey for us. So we're training survivors to help them understand the legislative process. We're training survivors to help them understand how to read statutes and laws. We're training survivors on how, through their own experiences, that they can develop policies that they would like to see change here in the state of Michigan. And I want to talk a f uh, about a few of those uh, changes. As I mentioned, the state of Michigan have been failing crime victims for decades. The state of Michigan by far had the worst victim compensation program in the entire country. In order to be eligible for victim compensation, you only had 48 hours to file a police report in order to be eligible for the program. So if you meet that threshold, you only had a year after you have been a victim to apply for the program. There are also other significant barriers that exist in the compensation uh, program um, as well. And so what we did, we organized. We organized to now, uh, we changed the uh, Michigan Victim Compensation Program. We removed those barriers. We extended, uh, increased the cap from 25,000 to 45,000 for survivors to be eligible to get the support that they need, the counseling, uh, the, the, the housing relocation, the lost wages after becoming a victim. So we're changing laws within our criminal justice system, especially as it relates to victim services as well. But we're also trying to build this infrastructure of victim services in communities by establishing trauma recovery centers. So a trauma recovery center is a one-stop shop center that provides support and services to all victims of violent crime so that they can walk into a center and get access to counseling, get access to helping to fill out that long victim compensation uh, program. We're building this infrastructure uh, across the state of Michigan and we just are planning to announce our first trauma recovery center uh, in the city of Detroit. As we're building this infrastructure of trauma recovery centers, as I mentioned, survivors have a voice in criminal justice policy making as well. So here in the state of Michigan, one of our key bills this year is productivity credits. We know that most individuals who are in the Department of Corrections, they're coming home one day. And they are coming back home to our communities. 
So we want them to come back home accessing uh, job, better job skills, getting access to mental health, drug treatment, life skills uh, programs. So productivity credits is a policy that's about being smart on safety. Because that's what this is about, safety. When crime victims cannot access support, we are failing in safety. When people in the justice system cannot get time to be rehabilitated and be able to earn time that will allow them to see their parole board sooner, we are failing safety. When we are providing a lot of barriers for people to access jobs in local hospitals, we are providing barriers for people to access housing and other employment opportunities, we are failing as it relates to safety. So this isn't a, a conversation about justice reform as it relates to just reducing incarceration. This is a conversation about safety because this is not about crime stats, it's not about graphs, this is about real people. This is about real people across the state of Michigan that have been disrespected and disregarded for decades. It's time for that to change. And it changes by bringing together crime survivors, people with old records, and organizations like Safe and Just Michigan, the Alliance for Safety, and other organizations across the state to build this new vision of safety here in the state of Michigan. And so I'm in this room because many of you care about safety. Many of you care about healing. And many of you care about where this state move forward. I think we all want to be safe, right? So everybody here, just, just close your eyes and, and, just, and just think about where you feel most safe. For some of us, we might be thinking about a garden, might be thinking in, at church, in a living room, might be thinking at, at a local park, at the playground, at a basketball game, at a baseball game. Now open your eyes with me. I'm 99% sure none of you thought about you felt most safe with more prisons. <laughs> I'm quite sure 99% of you didn't think about that. So we have to actually invest in things that make us safe which is ensuring survivors get access to healing and support, ensuring that people can access jobs, housing, and economic stability. So I'm here in this room with you all because you all care about safety. Is it gonna take all of us to use our power, our relationships, and our influence to make sure the state of Michigan don't go back to where it was before? And we can do that by working together, and we can do that by building this new vision of safety that's rooted in community healing, prevention, rehabilitation, and reentry. Let's do this, y'all. I told you, I told you, definitely in for a treat. You're not getting it. <laughs> I got called to the sideline when I was over there. Coach told me I shouldn't have said that. So for future references, SJM hats are $100 and anybody that don't like them, <laughs> anybody, Anybody that don't like the price, talk to Kate. <laughs> so, much respect to you, brother. Much respect.
that was deep. That was deep. And you spoke not only from lived experience, from a place that we can all identify with. All of us have lost somebody. All of us have experienced injustices with the system in some kind of way. And the way you've crafted that, that's dope. That's dope. We need your voice in this movement. We gonna be working, for sure. But he did mention a few things that caught my attention. I'm gonna keep it short, because Coach told me to. So you mentioned Priscilla Bordeo. What I didn't know about Priscilla was that she runs the organization you work for. Shameless plug, we just hired her sister here at SJM. <laughs> The other thing I didn't know was that they're identical twins. So hopefully that means we get them both by default. <laughs> if not, I still think we get both by default. <laughs> Tonight, I want to welcome to the stage a peer of mine, a brother in the movement, a giant in our work. Somebody that I admire a lot for his strength. Ronnie Waters, greatness. Keep it up. You've got a lot of value in this industry. A lot. I appreciate it all. I love working with you. I love all the work we do. We come from a place that not many people can identify with. That strength, that courage, it's respectable. Ronnie Waters, everybody. Um, yeah, I've been told to keep it quick, keep it quick, because um, <laughs> uh, um, Kate's standing somewhere back there with a big old um, Flavor Flav clock, so um, I got to, yeah. Um, life without parole for juveniles. So a lot of people don't know what JWAP means, so real quickly, life without parole for juveniles. It means that when you're sentenced to life in prison for a crime that you committed before you reach the age of 18, that they can keep you there until you are dead. Not old till you're dead. So bills were introduced to end this practice of, of letting kids die in prison, because we all know that kids have redeeming qualities. Kids can change. So we're hoping that they can get a second chance somewhere in the process. Now, I personally am under that same law. Okay, In 2012, the Supreme Court ruled that um, no juvenile should mandatorily be sentenced to life without this possibility of parole. And that means that we had to have something called a middle hearing. And in this hearing, if they can find something redeemable about you, some, something that says that this person is worth saving, then they can't resentence you to life without parole. They're not supposed to resentence you to life without parole. But fortunately for me and a lot of people in this room, we were able to prove that and come home. However, that sentence is still on the table. Judges can still sentence kids to die in prison. And the state of Michigan, a lot of people in this room, um, we feel that's wrong. That's wrong because kids should not be condemned to death for the mistake they made when they were 14, 15, et cetera. So there's bills in the legislature to pass and say that we're going to take that off the table. Just take it completely off the table. And fortunately, unfortunately, these bills have stalled. But we have 2014. And we feel that we're just going to keep, keep fighting, keep, keep pushing, keep making people, bring the issue to people's um, attention that this is wrong. Let's do away with that sentence, because if that sentence is on the table, there's a judge out there that's going to use that sentence. So we fought to get this, these bills passed. We haven't done it yet, but 
We're not giving up. We got 2014, excuse me, 2024. <laughs> you caught that? <laughs> yeah, so, so um, my job as Safe and Just is to galvanize support for the different campaigns that we are involved with. And I was thinking about how can I get some energy into the campaign. It seems like nothing was happening, you know? And I'm just um, brainstorming with people and I say, hey, Brian Stevenson. We need to bring Brian Stevenson to Michigan and get some inspiration from him, get some, uh, um, um, some moral leadership from this man. But how do we do that? Brian Stevenson is a very busy man. So my bright idea is say, hey, I'm going to go down there and just talk to him. I think I know this guy. You know, I read all of his cases and, you know, you know uh, and seen his movies and read his books. So I think I know this guy. So I'm going to go down there and talk to him and see if we can't bring him back to Michigan. I, um, I sent an email to him and his people, to my surprise and everybody else's surprise, he said, come on down. I said, what? He said, come on down. <laughs> Went down there and just started talking to him, because I know, I know this guy, you know? And he say, man, if I believe in what you're doing, I believe in what you guys are doing in Michigan, if there's any way I can get there, man, I'm gonna try to juggle my schedule, but um, it, this has been the most chaotic year of my life, but I'm gonna try to juggle my, my schedule and get to your annual dinner. Unfortunately, as you all can see, he did not make it. <laughs> But, but he say, hey, you know, I can't come, man. And he was sincere, man. I believe every word the man said. I'm, uh, me and um, uh, Michelle Rubin, that's, that's, hey, we love the guy. And I, I just, but he say, I'm on the clock. He say, um, I can't make it, man. I just can't. He say, but if these bills do not get passed this year, count me in for 24. I said, that, hey. And he also said something, something very powerful. He said, can I do a video for you guys? And um, John started jumping up and down when he said that, man. He said, can I do a video for this guy? He said, of course you can, Mr. Stevenson. The videos, monitors to your right and monitors to your left. Hello, my name is Brian Stevenson. I'm the director of the Equal Justice Initiative. And I just want to thank all of you for standing with Safe and Just Michigan. We're living at a time when there's a rising tide of fear and anger taking over our country. We've seen what that's done in the past. Until 1972, we had a very relatively small prison population in this country, less than 300,000 people in jails and prisons. But then the politics of fear and anger kicked in and we made horrific investments in incarceration across this country. We went from less than 300,000 people in our jails and prisons to 2.3 million. Today we are the nation with the highest rate of incarceration in the world. We have 4% of the world's population, but 25% of the world's imprisoned. We allowed too many of our elected leaders to advance narratives rooted in fear and anger. Some argued that people who are drug addicted and drug dependent are criminals. And we put hundreds of thousands of people in our jails and prisons when we should have said that people suffering from addiction and dependency have a health problem. And we should have embraced a health intervention. We invested in incarceration and now here we are decades later with record levels of opioid addiction, tragic overdose deaths, undermining communities, disrupting families, creating heartbreak and tragedy. We can do better, but we cannot do better if we allow our policies to be shaped by fear and anger. That same narrative of fear and anger changed our policies as it relates to children. We allowed criminologists and those who had not really gotten close to kids to go around and argue that some children aren't children. And these criminologists began to use language that was rooted in fear and anger. They said that some kids look like kids, but they're not kids. They said these children are, quote, super predators. And we use that label to demonize uh, children all across this country. And the consequences have been tragic. 
We created zero tolerance in our schools. We began putting five and six-year-olds in handcuffs. We began creating pipelines from schoolhouses to jailhouses. We expelled more children. We suspended more children. We, we created dysfunction and despair in more communities. And now we realize that the way we have to move forward toward improved public safety is by embracing children, working with kids, recognizing that all children are children, that we show our commitment to children not by looking at how well we treat talented kids, gifted kids, and privileged kids, but we show our commitment to children by how we address and manage and respond to kids in crisis, disfavored kids, marginalized kids, poor kids. At Safe and Just Michigan, we believe that there are things we can and must do that will not only improve public safety, reduce violence, but also free ourselves from the burden of over-incarceration. Let's spend not millions of dollars more on unnecessary imprisonment, but let's spend millions of dollars creating fair, health, and safe communities. There are leaders, there are community members, there are people in this movement who can show us the way. I have the great privilege of representing people who have been condemned to die in prison, people who have been wrongly convicted, people who have unfairly sentenced. And what always amazes me is their resolve when they are released to not just go somewhere and recover, but to continue to find ways to help others. It's this community that's doing violence interruption. It's this community that is going into places where there's despair and hopelessness and helping young people see a better way. It's this community that has so much to share and say about how we promote public safety, how we create healthy communities. So join us in advancing reforms that move away from horrific and excessive punishments like life imprisonment without parole, and embrace, and embrace strategies for success, relief, and safety. I'm standing with all of you who are doing what can and must be done uh, to reduce over-incarceration, to create hope, to create healing, to create safety in our communities. Please join with us. Please continue the fight and stand with Safe and Just Michigan to advance these important reforms. Let's give Ronnie another round of applause. Yeah. That's right, we aim for the fences here at SJM. <laughs> We swing big every time. So for all you sitting on the sidelines, keep donating, because that video cost us some money. <laughs> we need more. But seriously, though, that is huge. For all of you that know who he is, what he speaks to, what he represents, I count it. He said Safe and Just Michigan three times. <laughs> You can say anything you want about us. Top that. There's <laughs> a whole lot of people that think they're doing big things in this industry, but top that. All credit to Ronnie on that one. All credit. I talk to Ronnie almost every day. Had no idea this was coming. I called the guy one day to do a check-in. He was on the road. I'm like, wait, what? He's like, yeah, I'm going to talk to Brian Stevenson. Hey, wait, what? Like, who just goes and talks to Brian Stevenson? Like, that, like, how, what? He came back with this. How can I complain? Well done, my friend. Well done. Hey, stop it, kid. <laughs> hey, man, listen. I got to give props when props are due. That? It's magnificent delivery. Magnificent. It's one thing to get a video, but for him to mention our name three times in that video, <laughs> no, sir. Impressive. Good job. All right. So I'm not going to get a chance to pick on anybody tonight because Kate's waving me from the corner. Her, my clock is ticking. So next up, Jennifer Cobina. Dungey. I hope I don't get in trouble for this, but she's on our board of directors. I should have said that first before bringing her to the stage. Also, Dr. Jennifer 
Jennifer. Also, treasurer. I'm definitely getting in trouble now. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm uh, Dr. Jennifer Kobina Dungy. Um, as, has been, as has been mentioned, I'm the treasurer of uh, the Board for Safe and Just Michigan. Um, it's my honor today to present the Lifetime of Service Award and the Justice Warrior Award to both an organization and an individual. The Lifetime of Service Award is presented to an individual who has shown a sustained commitment to criminal justice reform in Michigan over their career. So when the name of Deborah LaBelle came up as a possible recipient this year, it only made sense. It would be difficult to be involved in this work in Michigan without at least hearing her name. So Deb, she's dedicated to justice reform work, especially in the areas of youth justice and civil rights for women, girls, and immigrants, which reaches back for decades. So perhaps most notably, she was the lead counsel on the federal class action litigation, Hill et al. v. Cinder, filed in 2012. And that lawsuit filed by the ACLU of Michigan challenged Michigan's mandatory juvenile life without parole. That result, that ruling struck declared uh, the portion of the Michigan statute that abolished good time and disciplinary credits for juvenile lifers unconstitutional. And it also set a timeline for resentences re and required the parole board to take Miller factors into consideration at review for release. And it was part of a concerted effort to end juvenile life without parole, not just in Michigan, but everywhere in the United States. So as you likely know, the US Supreme Court eventually ruled that mandatory juvenile life without parole was, wasn't constitutional. So again, it wasn't constitutional. A subsequent ruling allowed people then, then sub sentenced under those laws to be resentenced. And as you all know, the work to end juvenile life without parole goes on, as it can still be applied under a judge's discretion. Deb LaBelle has never given up the fight. She has been present at many of the court hearings for Michigan's juvenile lifers, either at their trials or their resentencing. And she also has testified before House and Senate committee hearings in Lansing. She's also spoke tire tirelessly with journalists about why we need to end the sentence. But ending juvenile life without parole hasn't been her only area of interest. She's also led the fight in court cases that protected the rights of children and women who are incarcerated. In Doe's v. MDOC, she represented juvenile incarcerated with adults in Michigan prisons who were, subjugate, who were subjected to both physical and sexual violence or solitary confinement. This case resulted in an $80 million settlement with the state that covered people uh, who had been affected and who were incarcerated in a Michigan's prison while under the age of 18 between October 15, 2010 and February 24, 2020. In addition, in another case settled with the state in 2009, she represented women incarcerated in Michigan who had been subjected to sexual violence, sexual harassment, and privacy violations by prison staff. And that was a $100 million um, settlement. And so as I said, it's difficult to work in this space without at least knowing who she is. LaBelle is the director of the ACLU of Michigan Juvenile Life Without Parole Initiative. She's a coordinator of Michigan's Juvenile Mitigation Access Committee and co-founder of the National Campaign for Fair Sentencing of Youth and the Youth Justice Fund. But perhaps most notably, she is considered a friend to many people in this room who were once sentenced to life without parole as children and to those who received that sentence still waiting to come home. So we couldn't be more pleased to present Deb LaBelle with the Lifetime of Service Award. Unfortunately, she couldn't be here today, so uh, Dr. Cheryl Kubiak is going to come to um, receive this award. It is um, very, very uh, humbling uh, to be up here to say anything on behalf of my, my good friend, uh, Deb LaBelle. And I know that many of you in this room have very deep affection. So at 5 o'clock this morning when she said, if you're going tonight, could you do this? Um, of course I said, 
Sure. Uh, so at uh, five minutes to four, uh, she sent this. So I'm going to read you Deb's words and hope that I can be a tenth of the eloquence that I know she would give to these. I regret not being able to spend an evening with folks who have shared a vision of our need to bend that arc toward justice, especially in times when it does not always appear that justice, equity, and human rights are high on the agenda. I am pleased that Dean Kubiak, who has a deep commitment to these goals, was able to address you. I started this specific work on what is broadly called youth justice over 10 years ago with recognition of the basic but absolute truisms that children are our future, that all children are deserving of the right to our protection and treatment consistent with their inherent dignity and worth. And that I believed then, as now, that a society's treatment of its children reveals much of its beliefs and exposes its fault lines, including the inequities resulting from racial, gender, and economic discrimination. As a Soros Justice Fellow, I spent months going into adult prisons talking with children who were detained in the adult prisons. And though it did not take long into these talks to realize our treatment of children in Michigan exposed a dangerous disregard of our responsibilities towards all our children and to our future. It was so far afield from basic human and child right tenants. It was simply difficult to know where to begin to challenge the injustices. I do remember talking with one 17 year old and we met several times to talk about human rights treaties. And of all things, because knowing that the world understood him to be a child with rights and protections, knowing that the world did not agree with punishing him with extreme incarceration, knowing that the world recognized a child's unique role in society and capability for growth and change, and that documents were signed that said this took some of the weight and burden from him, giving him a vision that others believed his punishment was unjust. And the fundamental problem seemed to be that a child was not treated as a child. If they caused harm, they were to be transformed into an adult immediately, and their child status simply disappeared, and along with it, our humanity. So a handful of us met nationally, and we decided we would take the greatest harm in society and work through litigation, documentation, education, media, and advocacy to reclaim the recognition of a child as a child. A child entitled to protection and treatment, even if it involved a homicide. We started over 10 years ago when there were two 2,500 children sentenced to die in adult prisons incarcerated for the rest of their life in the U.S. And there were none in the rest of the world. Now over a thousand of those formerly incarcerated to juvenile life without parole are free and back in our communities. 185 in Michigan. Another 1,200 have been resentenced and are waiting parole. <laughs> but over 350 remained incarcerated, the most here in Michigan, and we still have work to do. Michigan just received an F grade by the Human Rights Watch. Other states, Mississippi, Louisiana, Georgia, and Alabama, are still punishing without regard for their child status. But tonight, with the progress we have made with the work of so many, and now with the assistance of so many youth coming out to help with the movement towards justice, I'm honored to be counted as one of the people who will continue to work to bend the arc of future towards justice. Because injustice is only overcome when you reveal the truth and have people strong enough to tell that truth. And I know this room 
is filled with many of them tonight. Thank you on behalf of Deb. I know this will be very treasured. Thank you so much, Dr. Kubiak. So our next award is the Justice Warrior Award for an organization. Looking out at this wonderful audience, I see people here with us tonight who are not only just active uh, with Safe and Just Michigan, but also who are active with our partner organizations across the state. So I don't want to leave anyone out, but I, just to name a few, this includes Nation Outside, Michigan Liberation, as well as Crime Survivors for Safety and Justice. So, and there are many, many more. Um, it's the ability of these organizations to work together that helped Michigan to achieve policy advances like Clean Slate, as well as the pretrial justice reforms. So tonight we want to honor one of the organizations that's really making a positive difference in our state. So the Michigan Center for Youth Justice has been front and center in improving the justice system for Michigan children. And I honestly, I don't have time to stand here and list all of their accomplishments in recent years, and I know we're running out of time, but just to name a few, in 2019, it led the way on Michigan's Raise the Age legislation. So until then, 17-year-olds in the justice system, they were routinely treated as adults, even though they were not allowed to uh, vote, they were not allowed to buy cigarettes, couldn't buy a lottery, tickets and couldn't join the military. And two years later, it followed with the juvenile records protection laws. So remember how teachers used to warn us that anything we did would go down on our permanent record? Well, uh, Michigan Center for Youth Justice and most other people just don't think it's right that something you did when you were 12 or 13 or 14 years of age continues to haunt someone for the rest of their lives. And so now it won't. Thanks to their work, this clean slate for young people makes sure that juvenile records are no longer public. Today, the organization is active in the Juvenile Justice Reform Task Force. And you guys can give an applause for the fact that it's no longer public. So that group wrote up several legislation recommendations which have since been drafted into bills now before the legislature. So in short, the Michigan Center for Youth Justice is really a powerhouse that's transforming the justice system for Michigan children. So we're proud of the work they're doing and glad that we get to partner with them on so many issues that are vital to both their organization and ours, as well as people around our state. So I want to invite the Michigan Center uh, for Youth Justice Executive Deputy Director Jason Smith to come up and accept this award along with our gratitude for the work that they do. Hi, good evening, everyone. Can you, can you hear me okay? Yeah. All right, good evening everyone. I'm Jason Smith. I'm the Executive Director of the Michigan Center for Youth Justice. Um, I'm the, uh, here representing the org today. Uh, the Most of our staff were in a, at an event in Detroit um, doing a listening session with young people to under, get their perspective on what is needed around juvenile justice reform. So thank you uh, on behalf of the entire team. Um, we have an amazing uh, staff. Uh, we have board members here. Uh, Mary King, our former executive director, came and she really set the path for the work that we've been able to do, do recently. So just, you know, so happy to be among so many people that I, I personally care about and have worked with for so long. Uh, John is a mentor to, to me and Kate is a mentor to our deputy director in, in many ways and, and a support for us. So we're going to keep fighting the, with the work that we do. I mean, we have been successful recently around really common sense approaches uh, for how you should treat young people in the, the juvenile justice system. I mean, uh, what Cher uh, Cheryl said on behalf of Deb LaBelle really hit the, the nail on the head. When kids get in trouble, they're still kids. Um, it's common sense that a 17-year-old should be treated like a youth. It's common sense that a young person who has uh, a record once they get in trouble if, if should be able to move on with their life and thrive. It's common sense that uh, a family shouldn't be imposed huge fines and fees like we, we currently have here in Michigan that cripple their life uh, for years to come. And, and that's what we're really fighting for to change. So we, you heard about the Juvenile Justice Task Force recommendations and the legislation that's currently moving. We had some really good success around those bills in a tough climate, as you've heard. 
Um, bills have moved both through the House and Senate. We hope they'll get to the governor's office soon um, for signature. Um, they will be transformative in how young people are treated for and cared for when they come in contact with the justice system, but they're foundational. Even with those changes, which we're so proud of and we've worked hard with our, our partners on, there's still so much work to do. I mean, the juvenile life without parole work, I'm so grateful for the, the work that Safe and Just Michigan is doing on that. Whenever a reporter calls me to ask about it, I always say, you got to talk to Ronnie or, or, or Jose Burgos. <laughs> you know, those, those are your people you need to talk to about that. Um, earlier, there was data given about the number of, of people in prison. I couldn't even tell you how many young people are in uh, detentions or long-term residential facilities across the state because that data is just not kept on children. We don't have a minimum age in this state, so a child of any age can come in contact with the juvenile justice system. So we're celebrating the reforms that we've been able to accomplish in recent years and what we hope to get done in the next month or so, but there's a lot of work to do, and with your support, we'll be able to do that. So thank you very much. Thank you. So our final award is the Justice Warrior Award for an individual. Like the previous award, this one recognizes that being, uh, that being done to, uh, doing the work being done to advance the cause of criminal justice uh, reform in Michigan, but this time on an individual level. So as we know, any organization is only as strong and capable as the people who come together to create it. Fortunately, in Michigan, we have no shortage of people who are coming together to create communities that are safer and more just for everyone. And picking just one person to honor isn't a small task. However, this year, one person stood out, and that is Peter Martell, who has lived a remarkable life. After all, there aren't many people who have had the chance to clerk for a state Supreme Court justice. There are even fewer who were given the opportunity to do that after spending a decade in solitary confinement, but Pete has. But this is, this is not what Pete is being honored for today. Instead, tonight, he's being honored for what happened after his job offer at the state Supreme Court generated first a controversy and then a statewide conversation on second chances. So Pete has been active in Michigan justice uh, reform movement since 2008, when he came home after serving 14 years in Michigan prisons. Most of that time was done in solitary confinement. Pete credits the love and support from his family for helping him endure that time. And, he, and when he came home in 2008, he was ready to move forward. Pete went back to school with the aim of getting a law degree, and a lot of people doubted him. Many people even doubted that he could or even that he should try to get a law degree. Outside this room, not everyone believes in second chances. But Pete, he still pressed on. He graduated from Wayne State Law School, and he passed the bar in 2017. And he's still going to school, by the way. Uh, currently, he's, um, he's now a graduate student in sociology at the University of Michigan. Pete wants the education so he can try to make a difference in a system that he saw firsthand was not working. And you may also know him through his work at SADO and the AFSY Michigan Criminal Justice Program. Uh, but at the start of 2023, he got the opportunity of a lifetime, and that was to clerk at the state Supreme Court. So who wouldn't jump at that chance? But his celebration, it was cut short when Justice Bolden was sharply criticized for hiring someone who had been incarcerated. Rather than allow Supreme Court and Justice Kyra Harris Bolden to become the focus of controversy, Pete Martel, he chose to step down. By handling the situation with unimaginable grace, Pete put a spotlight on the harsh realities faced by justice-involved people. No matter how much they accomplish, no matter how much good they do, no matter how high they climb, no matter how much time has passed, some people still, still do not believe in second chances. So that started a conversation in Michigan that went on for weeks, a real dialogue that actually changed minds. Even some of Pete's harshest critics reevaluated their opinions and had a change of heart. Giving up on that opportunity must have been a hard choice, but yet Pete allowed the rest of the world to see how collateral consequences work and continue to affect the lives of so many people who leave home and return, who leave prison and return home. 
But Pete also shows us that that, that doesn't need to destroy a person. Pete, he did not crumble, but rather he kept his head held high. While he gave up on that dream, we know he has an amazing future in store, and we cannot wait to see it unfold. So Pete Mardell, we are proud to present you with the 2023 Justice, Award, Justice Warrior Award for an individual. Let's give him a round of applause. Sit down, sit down. This is incredible, thank you. Thank you, Safe and Just. John, Kate, everybody there. Um, Ronnie, after everything broke at the Supreme Court, one of the first links my friend sends to me is Ronnie on some local uh, news show talking about Pete Martel. <laughs> and he leaves, he leaves the whole conversation with, just wanna let you guys know, like, it's not like Pete Martel's gonna rob somebody up on the Supreme Court. <laughs> And it was perfect. I was just getting out of the shower listening to this. I thought, thank you, Roddy. Perfect. So um, this is a, a huge honor. Um, I don't know how I get picked on this, but uh, thank you guys so much for the recognition. Um, so much to say, but also just want to express gratitude. And there's a long, long line of, of, of gratitude here, starting with my parents, um, my brother and sister. They were there throughout 10 years in solitary confinement and 14 years in prison, and uh, certainly it kept me sane. They were there to support and to visit and to send books and to encourage me to keep writing and to study. Um, other people along the way, well in the whole, Paul Reingold and Kim Thomas at the clinical law program at University of Michigan Law School, um, they kept in touch. And after I had, I was coming up on 10 years in solitary confinement, I got the letter from Kim Thomas at the clinic who said, Pete, we just got a good decision from the US Supreme Court about solitary confinement. We're gonna pick up your case. We're gonna get you out of the hole. We just need you to sign these papers. And before they could even really get to work on too much stuff, the Department of Corrections moved me over to Marquette and let me know we've got big walls here and we've got gun towers and we use, our, our, our guards in those towers use those guns. We don't think you're gonna try to escape. And I'm like, no, of course I'm not gonna try to escape. At this point, I'm like six years past my earliest release date. No, I'll take the parole, thank you. But um, so mom, dad, Kim, Paul, Matt, Melissa, Natalie Holbrook, who I met while I was in the hole. She was doing work on long-term solitary confinement and reached out to a bunch of us. Um, she would also eventually take a second chance on me once I was released, gave me a good job getting out of prison. Um, just so thankful to be in this group of so many people who are doing so much good work. And um, like we're all kind of coming out of solitary confinement to some point after like all of the quarantine we've been in. Trust me, it drives you absolutely crazy. Um, but maybe don't email people, maybe don't text people, maybe call people, maybe get together and have coffee with people again, just like meet people in person and to talk because there's nothing better than that. <laughs> That's wild. My God, the saint that you are. Thank you so much for coming tonight, sharing your story, everything that you've been through no idea where you get the strength from. You're absolutely a saint, and thank you so much. It's really incredible. That's all I have. Thank you guys so much. The whole crew at AFSC, we're, I'm so happy and honored to be working with you guys daily, day in, day out. My semi, Rep Havman, thank you for the work that you've done. And Keith Barber is still back there. <laughs> Keith was a field investigator in the ombudsman's office when I was in the hole, and he's the one who sat down and met with my parents and explained in the process about why I was being held up on being released, and he went to bat for me again and again and again, and just wrote one letter after the other to the warden at Oaks Correctional Facility, David Gundy. Um, <laughs> Keith, thank you. Thank everybody in your office for the great work that you guys do. Appreciate you all. Thank you all. What a powerful group of people. Many different respects, many different industries have come together in the name of criminal justice reform. <clears throat> One person that was very skim about who she is, is Dean Kubiak. Dean Kubiak is the Dean of Social Work at <laughs> Wayne State University. 
recognizing the harm that the criminal justice system does to our communities. She stepped into a space to try to fill that gap, to try to create a space for those resources and allow students to get a direct understanding of how the system impacts people. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for accepting that award on behalf of Deb. Tonight we've heard a lot from a lot of different people. We've heard from crime survivors. We've heard from social workers. We've heard from Dr. Jennifer Cabina Dungeon. <laughs> I watched our president die three times while watching the film today. <laughs> Slid right down her chair. Never seen somebody come back alive so fast. I hope that saved my job. Also tonight, I've heard and noticed a lot of people sneaking in and out of that door over there. I just want to say, for clarity, you do not have to sneak. We encourage you to take whatever's over there. <laughs> Put it in your pockets and take it with you. It's great. It's free. We're not going to stop you. He nodding. He got a pocket full of stuff. <laughs> Pete, champion, bro. In the world that we live in, in the space that we work in, who would have thought it would be a white guy that became the face of Second Chances? <laughs> make that make sense in 2023. <laughs> it's funny, but it's so true. Who would have thought? that that would be the conversation. You handled that one like a boss. Well done, my friend. I'll take you up on that lunch date. <laughs> All that in mind, we are reaching the end of our annual meeting. I will now introduce Kate McCracken. Thank you all. Oh, goodness. Ken's tall. So I'm Kate McCracken. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Safe and Just Michigan, also apparently the timekeeper of no fun <laughs> here at the organization. But, um, but honestly, it's just so amazing to be here with all of you tonight. So many familiar faces. It's just really warms my heart because for those of you who know me, I'm kind of still in the Zoom bubble. I don't get out a lot, so this feels really good to be around all of you. I do, before I get to my thank yous, because that's really what I'm here for, is I do want to acknowledge that on your tables, there are cookies from the 490 Bakery and chocolates from uh, Confections with Convictions. Those are two businesses here in Michigan that are second chance employers, and we love to support their business and we love their treats. So we encourage you each to take um, those treats home with you um, and to learn more about their businesses. Uh, they are uh, really wonderful and we love to uh, see second chance employers here in Michigan. So it's been a really remarkable evening. Um, I really can't thank each of you enough for joining us. I know some of you made it through crazy uh, traffic to get here. Um, it really means so much to the Safe and Just Michigan team to be surrounded by so many dedicated advocates for social justice here in Michigan. Tonight I have the honor to say thank you to all of you and to the organizations you represent. I am admire your passion and courage to challenge the dominant narrative about what makes our community safe. We know what makes Mi Michigan safe. It's people like Ken Nixon, Ronnie Waters, E.B. Jordan, over in the fly green hat, <laughs> Scott Tompkins, Tony Gant, and so many more of our formerly incarcerated leaders that are home in our communities, lifting up their voices every day to fight for safety, healing, and justice. We know the reforms we are all advancing with dedication and a warrior spirit 
is what makes us experience healing and safety. There are so many people in this room that have partnered with Safe and Just Michigan over the years. I want to thank Kathy and John Gourlay that stepped in as part of Friends of Restorative Justice and helped us plan the Day of Empathy, only to have all of our legislative visits canceled because of a snowstorm in Michigan. <laughs> Cecilia and Ken and Lawanda and the rest of the Nation Outside team, thank you for mobilizing a movement of formerly incarcerated leaders across the state. You are making history. Thank you to the teams at my SEMI and AFSC who are leading the coalition for the Second Look legislation. We appreciate your tireless, tireless leadership to fight for those who experience unnecessary long prison sentences. A Brighter Way, Michigan Center for Youth Justice, and Wayne State University are partners here tonight paving the way for reforms in the juvenile and criminal justice system. Time doesn't permit me to thank all of you, but know that you bring light to my heart and you motivate me to continue on this marathon that we call criminal justice reform. We could, could, could not conclude this evening without recognizing the Safe and Just Michigan team. We're grateful for the Safe and Just Michigan Board, led by the remarkable Anna Cohn. The collective wisdom of our board has guided us through two decades history here in Michigan. <laughs> and our team, wow. I'm amazed at how we have changed since I joined with John, Safe and Just Michigan, six and a half years ago. We are bigger, we're more diverse, and we're full of extensive professional and lived experience. Every day, I'm amazed at the high quality and professional communication products that Zach and Barbara create. Our outreach team includes a dynamic trio with so much experience building relationships with stakeholders across the state and inside our state prison system. Ken, Dina, and Ronnie, thank you for working so deliberately and thoughtfully to bring new and old faces into our work. Our policy and research team, John, Kamau, Cassie, and Jasmine, you continue to build a robust strategy to advance key reforms that have changed Michigan. Just look at what we've been able to accomplish over the years. Veronica and Ashley, you both create meaningful connections with our key stakeholders and make our organizational fundraising and daily operations a success. A big thank you to our three fellows and our intern, Erica, Nomitria, Cecilia, and Sonnet. We appreciate your dedication to our mission and our vision. I would also like to acknowledge our event sponsors. We are hosting this event every year, um, and you make it so much easier for us to create a space for all of us to celebrate and connect. And my colleague, Ashley, our grants manager, will now join the stage, and I know she's gonna echo my thanks. So as she comes up, thank you all. Travel safely, and there is dessert in the atrium, so don't forget to enjoy that before you hit the road home. So thank you. Hello. <laughs> Um, I am Ashley. I'm the grants manager at Safe and Just Michigan, so I am raising the funds to do the work. Um, so I just wanted to um, just uh, thank everybody for being here. Um, thank you for believing in this work. Thank you for the, the decades and decades. We know that some of this stuff takes a long, long time, and that's a, a commitment. So thank you. Um, I did want to uh, highlight our sponsors. Um, as Kate said, our sponsors for the evening help us keep this event free, help us keep it uh, celebratory in nature, um, really focused on uh, the progress that we've made over the year. So um, I wanted to thank um, Andy Ribbons with Premier Finishing. Uh, they are a business on the west side of the state um, that champions second chances. Um, they know not only, they are not giving people second chances to work with them just out of the kindness of their heart or compassion, but because they're good workers and they know that. Um, 
So thank you to Premier Finishing. Um, and then I, of course, also wanted to echo and thank you to Wayne State University School of Social Work. We have the whole uh, or a lot of the Center for Behavioral Health and Justice here. So thank you guys for, for making tonight happen. <laughs> um, and um, I hope that everybody gets home safe. Thank you for driving all this way. And as the fundraiser, I would be remiss <laughs> um, if anybody would like to make a gift tonight. There are cards on your table. You can scan the QR code, or of course, we will accept checks. I don't know if it's over 100 if we can give you a hat. That's not up to me. <laughs> but, but truly. Um, Thank, thank you all. Um, there's, there's lots of different types of work that uh, need to happen to make this movement go forward. So thank you everyone in this room for uh, giving in the capacity that you are um, able to give your time, your talent, your skills, your commitment. So thank you uh, and drive safe and please do try to get some dessert. So. <laughs>